We're now going to move on to a mean forecast error. We're looking at chapter 4, slide 19, or excuse me, 18 and 19. The mean forecast error, or MFE, looks for a bias of errors towards forecasting, over forecasting, or under forecasting. We're looking for the running, running sum of forecast errors, or RSFE. And that's nothing more than the deviation, the actual forecast minus the actual demand, excuse me, minus the forecasted demand. And we, we ideally want this to be zero. So if we look at this on slide 19, we've actually done the math here before. The actual deviation, again, for our same six time periods, one, two, three, four, five, and six, are the negative five, 120 minus 125, five, or 130 minus 125, negative 15, 110 minus 125, positive 15 for the 140 minus 125, negative 15, 110 minus 125, and five again for the 130 minus 125. Again, our M, F, E, or uh, mean forecast error is the running sum of the forecast errors divided by N, or the number of time periods, which in actuality is the sum of each actual minus forecasted demand divided by N. Just like we've done each and every single time, we're going to take that deviation, A minus F here, and we're going to sum it up. So negative 5 plus 5 is 0, plus negative 115 is a negative 1, or excuse me, negative 15 is a negative 15, plus 15, we're back to 0, minus 15 is a negative 15, uh, plus 5 is a negative 10. So our numerator here, or the running sum forecast error, is a negative 10. And we are dividing this, again, by our number of time periods, which was 6. And if we do the math quickly, we should get a negative 1.67. Now, looking at this, remember we said that a positive MFE is under forecasting. A positive MFE is under forecasting because our actual de demand is higher than the forecasted demand. So a negative MFE, we're over forecasting. Our actual demand is lower than the forecasted demand. So what we're looking at here is a negative MFE. What does this mean? It means that we have over forecasted here. Our actual demand is less than, on average, what we have been forecasting. Again, that is the MFE, or mean forecast error. And we're going to continue on to the mean absolute percentage error. In chapter 4, on slide 20 here, and slide 21, we're looking at a mean absolute percentage error. And this is actually a percentage. This is where we can actually take a look at a forecasting method and said, oh, look, this is what happened. And the formula in your book is a little bit different than the one I'm going to give you, but if you take a look at uh, the math in it, it's still the same. But I like to be repetitive. And if you noticed with um, mean absolute deviation, mean squared error, uh, mean forecast error, MAD, MSE, and MFE, we sort of followed the same pattern. I like patterns. I understand the pattern. It, I can get in that mode and just keep going with it. And so we've tweaked the formula a little bit so that it fits that same pattern. So literally, what we are going to do is take the sum of 
100 times the, the actual demand minus the forecasted demand divided by the actual demand and divide that by the number of observations or the number of time periods that we have taken. So when we go out to slide 21 to actually calculate, you'll see again the same things that you've seen before. The actual demand in that first column, the forecasted demand in the second, the deviation A minus F in the third. Here we're going to have the absolute deviation of A minus F and then working towards that absolute percentage of error, which writing the formula above that is actually going to be 100 times the absolute value of A minus F divided by A. So in my time periods, again, one, two, three, four, five, and six. I'm going to take my deviation, and I'm just going to quickly write these in because we've already uh, looked at these. We've already com computed these numbers when we worked on our our MAD, our MSE, and then our MFE. We, we had these same numbers all the way across. And now let's get that absolute deviation back from where we did the MAD. So negative 5 would be 5, a positive 5 would be 5, negative 15 will be 15, 15 will be 15, negative 15 will be 15, and 5 will be 5. Now comes the computation. In order to do this computation, I'm going to take this column, my absolute deviation, and divide it by my actual demand. So, and then I'm going to multiply it by 100 to get my absolute percentage of errors. So I'm going to take 5 and divide it by 120 and multiply by 100. And let me write that in black. And you should get 4.17. I'm going to take for the second time period 5 divided by 130. And you should get 3.85. 15 divided by 110 times 100 and you should get 13.64. 15 divided by 140 for the fourth period times 100 is 10.71. 15 divided by 110 times 100 is again 13.64 and then 5 divided by 130 times 100 is 3.85. Again, my mean absolute percentage of errors, I am taking the sum of 100 times the absolute value of the actual minus the forecasted demand divided by the actual and dividing that by n. So I need to sum up this last column. So adding 4.17, 3.85, 13.64, 10 10.71, 13.64, and 3.85, you should get 49.86. So that number becomes my numerator. And I'm going to divide that by n, my number of time periods, which is 6. And the answer should be 8.31. Now remember we said this was a percentage. So we're making our forecasting errors 
approximately 8.31% of the times. So we actually can say here is a percentage and we can take a look. And of course, when you're looking at errors, do you want a larger percent or a lower percent? I personally would prefer a lower percent of errors. So 8.31, we can take a look at 10%, 2%, which uh, forecasting method is doing a better job. Now, everything that we've looked at so far, MAD, uh, mean absolute deviation, MSE, uh, mean squared error, MFE, mean forecast errors, uh, MAPE, M-A-P-E, uh, mean absolute percentage of errors, have all been taking a look at forecasting methods and seeing how well they're doing. But what happens if you actually want to forecast? You actually want to find out that forecasting number. There's ways to do that. And we're going to do that looking at simple moving averages. Looking at a simple moving average. We're in chapter four, slide 23. A simple moving average is nothing more than finding a mean, finding an average of a specific amount of data. This problem looks at a three month simple moving average. That means we're going to take a mean of three months worth of information. So here, instead of time period one, two, three, we're looking at months, 2021, 20, 22, 23, 24, and 25. And we wanna start with data to get a forecasted demand for that next month or for next year during this time period, depending on what we're looking at. So what we do is we take three time periods here, three months, and find the average of that. So to find the average of months 20, 21, and 22, we're going to take 120 plus 130 plus 110 and divide by three, which should give us 360 divided by three, or this first three month uh, simple moving average is actually 120. We're then going to just slide down one month and pick up the next month. So we're gonna be taking a look instead of time period 20, 21, and 22, we're now looking at 21, 22, and 23. So we're going to have 130 plus 110 plus 140, which should give us 380. And we're going to divide that by three, which should give us 126.67. Again, we're going to slide down just one month to take the next simple moving average. And it's gonna be starting with time period 22, 23, and 24. So with this, we're going to take 110 plus 140 plus 110, which should be 360, and divide by three, the number of time periods we're moving, we're using in our simple moving average. So 360 divided by three is 120. Using what we have left, time period 23, 24, and 25, we're going to take those three time periods and add them up 140 plus 110 plus 130, which should give us 380, and divide again by the number of time periods we're using, which would give us 
126.67. So our simple moving average is literally taking an average of a subset of data. And as long as we have the number of months or the number of time periods that we're able to do, we can continue moving on. If we had a time period 26, I could move down one more. I have to have at least three months in this one or three time periods to be able to do the average because I want a three time period simple moving average. If I move down again with the information I have, I only had time period 24 and 25 left, I don't have enough information to take another simple moving average. So that is how you find the simple moving average within forecasting.